All right, in this video, I'm going over the Chandra and Skinner model for thinking about medical technologies and healthcare systems. And I'll put the link below to the, to the actual paper. And this is one of my favorite healthcare models because it's so powerful. And I think one of the traits of a really great model is that you can look at the model and use the model to do thought experiments that are above and beyond what's actually in the paper. And this is one of those models that I've learned a lot just playing around with the model, including things that were not in the paper. So I think it's a brilliant model. There's so many insights to be had by this model, and it really has changed the way I think about healthcare. So this video, I'm going to just explain what is the model and how do they use it in this paper. And then in some other videos, I'm going to be exploring what are the other ways of using the model to think about conundrums in the healthcare sector. So the key question in this particular paper is why do we have different countries with the same health outcomes but really different health spending? Does that have anything to do with their healthcare system and medical technologies that enter into the system or medical technologies that are kept out of the system? And really the two countries that help you think about this are the UK and the US. Of course the US has higher medical costs than many countries as a matter of fact than any country in the world and yet our outcomes are not that much better and in a lot of cases are worse than other countries. And the UK of course has a socialized healthcare system. They use the beverage model of healthcare and they actually have a government agency that decides which technologies the government of the UK is going to cover through their healthcare system. So they're looking at cost effectiveness and determining coverage by the government's insurance. And this paper explains how that alone could lead to what we're seeing in terms of the differences in cost without the differences in uh, patient outcomes or life expectancy across the two countries. That's the frame of this paper. So to think about this, there's this diagram, which is um, looking at two different countries with different emphases in terms of the technologies that they bring into their healthcare system. So we have three types of technologies that are defined by Chandra and Skinner in this paper. First is cost-effective technologies that we kind of know are cost-effective and have a really high benefit to the patient per dollar spent on the patient. That's type one technology. Type 3 technologies on the other end of the scale are cost ineffective technologies, technologies that cost a ton of money for a very small impact on health, and um, clumped in type 3 technologies are technologies where we have no idea the effectiveness or the cost effectiveness of the technology, and there's a lot of technologies like that. Now, the really interesting category here is the one in the middle, the type two technologies. These are technologies that are cost effective for some people, but not for all. And this is the category that's really most changed my thinking. So it's worthwhile looking at the graphs that they outline in the paper to better understand exactly what they mean by type one and type two technologies. All right, so here we have type one technologies graphed on this graph. And to understand the graph, first you need to understand the x-axis. So this is treatments, and treatments could be a procedure, it could be a drug that you take, um, it could be anything that's a medical technology that's applied to the patient. And really the way to think about the x-axis is that you imagine everybody who might need that technology and you line them up in order of how important that technology is to their health. So you're imagining people lined up on this axis. All right, so looking at this, we've got the person who benefits the most from the treatment. And how much do they benefit? Well, we could look at the y-axis, and the y-axis is, of course, value of quality-adjusted life years. Quality-adjusted life years are just how much does the technology extend your life, where you're adjusting it for, does it extend your life by five years, but... Um, two of those years are really uncomfortable and you don't function well, in which case you don't want to make that the same as a technology that gives you five fully free years of life. So you're sort of adjusting a little bit down based on the quality of life for those last two years in that case. So quality adjusted life years. Now, of course, that's a, a theoretical construct in economics, 
but we have some ways of estimating and measuring quality adjusted life years and I'll put some links below to some videos that might explain that. But in any case, the value of the quality adjusted life years means somehow we have to translate those extra life years that are gained by this patient getting the treatment into dollars. That means we have to put a dollar value on human life, which a lot of people are very uncomfortable doing, but we could choose 7 million, we could choose 12 million, we could choose 50 million, we could choose 2 million. Um, and there's different ways of estimating those that lots of people are uncomfortable with, but just to be clear, we're talking about the dollar, estimated dollar value of quality adjusted life years for this patient. So this dot here represents this particular patient, and this is the extra years gained in life, which might be like six months. I mean, most technologies aren't going to actually add years to your life. Most technologies will add a few months, um, and mostly that's going to come in the form of reduced pain in your life, and of course reduced pain can be translated into quality adjusted life years. So that's just the setup for the model. And <clears throat> the second person here is the person who benefits the second most from getting this medical treatment. And you can see, if you look at all of these people, and I didn't draw them all out, but this is a group of people, um, if you look at how much they benefit from the treatment, it's actually pretty similar for everybody in this group. But then out here on the edges you get people, and maybe these people are more frail, so maybe there's higher risk for them getting the medical technology. Maybe it could kind of push them over the edge, or if you operate on them on the surgery table, they have a chance of dying because of their other risks. So these are people who would benefit. For example, this person benefits a little bit from um, the quality adjusted life years of getting the treatment, but not nearly as much as this person. That's how to interpret this graph. And then this person, if you look at their um, value on the graph, they actually are, are harmed by getting the treatment. And of course, if you're a healthy person and you go into the surgery room, you're gonna be harmed by that, so no doctor is gonna recommend that a perfectly healthy person go get the surgery. So if you're healthy, you're certainly gonna be out here somewhere where your benefit from the treatment is negative, it's below zero. So that's the marginal benefit to each of these patients of getting the treatment. The marginal cost in this model has been simplified to just a fixed cost, which could be if it's surgery, that's sort of all of the added up costs of the labor from the doctor, the labor from the nurses, all the surgical tools, all of the instruments and things that need to be thrown away afterwards. Everything is sort of wrapped up into the marginal cost. So why is this marginal? It's basically the dollar amount per patient. So if, it, if the, it's a $10,000 surgery, $10,000 per person surgery, then this would be $10,000. And the cost of treating this patient with that surgery is $10,000. Now, of course, we want to think about what's the golden rule of economics. The golden rule of economics says marginal cost equals marginal benefit. And this is from society's perspective, because obviously we know that the person is probably not going to pay the full $10,000 of their surgery. That's probably going to be shared in payment by the insurer, um, the government, all kinds of parties are contributing to the $10,000. The benefit, of course, is accrued to the particular patient, but this uh, graphic is from a societal standpoint. So from society's standpoint, we definitely want to provide medical treatments to every person whose benefit, whose total benefit in terms of value of quality adjusted life years, exceeds the cost of the treatment, the $10,000. So from a societal standpoint, if we're using the marginal cost equals marginal benefit rule, here's where marginal cost equals marginal benefit, that tells us that society wants to give all of these people this treatment. Um, now this person is kind of, this person actually, um, they do benefit from the treatment, but not that much, or certainly not um, a benefit that's equal to the $10,000 that, that society would spend on them. So according to this economic rule, and I'm not saying that's necessarily the right rule to use at all times, um, society would not treat this particular person. And then of course, nobody wants to treat these people. Doctors don't want to treat these people. Nobody wants to treat someone with the treatment who would be harmed by the treatment, who would have a benefit below zero. So um, this is the societal decision. And this is the doctor's decision. So the doctor is going to recommend surgery for every patient who could benefit from the surgery. 
So the doctor is going to say, nope, these people don't, should not get surgery. They'll be harmed by it. But everyone on this side of that um, marginal benefit greater than zero point is going to be is going to be recommended to have the surgery from the doctor's perspective. So for type one technologies, these are actually pretty similar groups. Society would say. Um, based on marginal cost equals marginal benefit, this group should get it. The doctor's decision rule, which is, the doctor's decision rule is marginal benefit greater than zero. The doctor says this group should get it. So there's a, a little bit more, um, a few more people get it in the doctor's decision compared to the societal decision, but not that many more. So um, this is very much a beneficial technology and we could actually look at the, um, the gains versus the costs, and we could we could shade those areas on this graph. So in this case, the total benefit is given by the area under the curve up through the doctor's decision, and that's a pretty large area. The total cost of this is going to be this box here, which is which is certainly in the the way I've drawn this smaller than the total benefit. Uh, so the certainly benefit outweighs cost. This is a very, very beneficial technology and everyone would say we want this technology to be adopted into our healthcare system. Now let's look at type 2 technologies that are going to use the same setup but, but are going to have a different shape of the graph and that's going to give us a different story. Alright, this is the shape of a type 2 technology where the key is that it's convex. The other one was concave, and that was a key feature of type 1 technologies. And why is that? Well, we know that treatments are on this axis, meaning just like before, we're lining up patients along this axis according to how beneficial that technology is to those patients. So here's a few random patients, and for each of these patients, you can see how much benefit does the patient get. And the key here is there's actually a ton of patients out here that get a pretty small benefit of the technology. There's a few patients who get a really large benefit, um, certainly a benefit that exceeds marginal cost, and there's a lot of patients sort of out here getting a little benefit but not much. And when we do the same comparison of the cost compared to the benefit of this technology, we're going to see a different story. All right, in this case we see the total benefit is given by the area under the curve that's shaded in purple in the vertical lines. The total cost is given by this orange box. It's the number of patients who receive the treatment by the $10,000 that you're paying per treatment. So it's this box. And in this case, the cost of the treatment to society um, seems like it's going to be bigger than the cost to the patient, or it, it, bigger than the benefit to the patient under the curve. So um, with this type of technology, we could potentially start to get in trouble if we end up implementing a ton of technologies like this and fewer technologies that are of the type 1 variety. So that's one um, outcome from this model that was outlined in the paper. There's another really cool thing that the paper outlines and let me show you that. Alright, I've drawn another version of a type 2 technology. In this case we have this line here representing the benefit to each patient along this axis from the treatment. And this is going to be from Dr. Perry's perspective. And of course, all models are going to be from someone's perspective. Um, but if we're thinking about the doctor's decision, and the doctor's decision is to treat every patient who has a benefit greater than zero, we know that this is going to be a decision that Dr. Perry makes rather than a decision that all doctors make. So the question is, if doctors have different opinions about the effectiveness of treatments, how is that going to affect this graph? And of course, where do doctors get their opinions? They get them from other doctors, they get them from reading the medical literature, they might get them from talking to drug companies or medical device companies about their new products. There's always that doctors come about their belief system about the effectiveness of a treatment. So variation in those beliefs might make a huge difference. As a matter of fact, that's what's going to happen in this model. So what I'm going to draw right now is a different doctor's opinion, where the difference in opinion is only very slight, but the difference in behavior and the difference of treatment of patients and the difference especially in costs are going to be really big. Alright, the purple line represents Dr. Pumphrey's opinion about the effectiveness of the treatment. The black line represents Dr. Perry's. And we can see the difference in the number of patients getting the treatment. Here, here is Dr. Pumphrey's number of patients. 
and here, here is Dr. Perry's. So we have almost at least a third increase in the number of patients treated by these two doctors, even though their opinions about the treatment are really, really similar. There's just a little bit of a difference. And when we actually look at the cost across these two different people, it's pretty dramatic. So total spending on Dr. Perry's patients is equal to this box. This is just the price of the treatment times the number of patients getting the treatment. And if you look at the box that represents the total spending on Dr. Pomfrey's patients, it's way, way bigger. So you have like a one-third increase in the spending on the treatments without much actual impact on health. As a matter of fact, we don't know if these extra patients are really benefiting from the treatment or being harmed by the patients. If you ask these two doctors, is this group of patients, uh, patient number 391 through patient number 456, all of these patients, Dr. Perry says those patients are slightly harmed by the treatment. Dr. Pomfrey says those patients benefit slightly from the treatment. So are they benefited or do harmed by the treatment? We actually don't know because these lines represent the doctor's opinion. So we don't know if we're adding at all to the benefit of the population, but we do know that if we're adding a benefit to the population, it's very small. And if we're adding a harm to the population, it is also very small by treating these extra people. But we're adding a huge amount of costs to the medical system by treating these extra patients. And the basic argument here is that you can get differences across regions because the differences in opinions between doctors Probably a lot of those opinions come from doctors talking to doctors, so you may have regional differences in doctors' viewpoints about how effective certain treatments are, and that could lead to one region having a one-third higher spending just because of the slight differences in the doctor's opinions about treatments. So this is a brilliant argument about one thing that might be going on in healthcare when we think about what technologies get utilized, what technologies get recommended for different patients. And I want to come back and look at this model from some different perspectives in other videos.